Today is July 7th, 2021, and my guest is economist James Heckman of the University of Chicago. He's the director of the Center for the Economics of Human Development there, and he was awarded the Nobel Prize in Economics in the year 2000. His first appearance on Econ Talk was in January of 2016, discussing the state of econometrics. Our topic for today is economic mobility and inequality, drawing on a recent NBER working paper in March of 2021 that he co-authored with Rasmus Landerso. That paper is Lessons from Denmark, Denmark about inequality and social mobility. There's also a non-technical version of that paper uh, with, this, with the results that I may quote as well, and it, we'll, we'll link to both of them. Jim, welcome back to Econ Talk. Well, it's nice to see you again, Russ. It's been years. We've been. Uh, it's been too long. We've been interacting for more than forty years now, for sure. That's a, so that's a little scary. You. Yeah, it's a yeah. little scary. Well, uh, it's good. We're still doing it. Yeah, that's a, that's a good sign. Um, a lot of people point to Scandinavia, Sweden, Finland, Norway, and Denmark as countries with policies that the U.S. should adopt. What are some of those policies that people, especially economists, have in mind, and why do economists often argue for emulating uh, Scandinavian social and economic policy? Well, it isn't just economists. It's a lot of politicians. I mean, this is a practice that goes back, I don't know when it started, but I know that it was very prevalent in the the years that Clinton, Kelly Clinton, was running for president, when she was actually in the U.S. Senate. Uh, And then, of course, more recently, Danish... uh, Policies have received a lot of attention from politicians like Bernie Sanders and sure. various progressive uh, uh, politicians. And so there's a famous headline. I'd have to, I don't, can't quote it literally, but I believe that uh, it says something, it's from the Washington Post maybe seven years ago, six years ago, and it says the, the American dream is now lived in Scandinavia. That was the essence of what's going on. And that Scandinavian policies will provide a basis for providing social mobility, for equality, and giving a sense of fairness to the larger world. All the concerns about inequality that people have mirrored and discussed and continue to discuss to this moment, um, allegedly those problems are solved once we look in Scandinavia. And so Sanders in particular and the, and the current progressives in the Senate and the House in the U.S. Congress uh, and uh, uh, and other agencies around uh, Washington, other groups around Washington, continuously point to things like the fact that child care is completely subsidized, completely subsidized. College tuition is free. Nobody pays any tuition. Um, that health care is universal and access is open to everyone. And that expenditures, at least as measured on school, as measured by teacher salaries, and other dimensions of child uh, quality in, in school, uh, the schooling that children are getting, is about the same, it's forced to be the same. Teacher salaries are universal over all parts of Denmark. There may be a slight modification for cost of living, but it's very close to universal. And the reason why I can confirm that all these policies are in place is that I've been analyzing what is called registered data from, from Denmark. Unlike the U.S., in Denmark, there are registers. Everybody signs up at birth, and they end up at death in the the register. And so we can monitor every major event, every event, actually, in the life of Danes from birth to death. We know where they go to school, when they're born, what the quality of the school is, who else went to school with them, what neighborhood they lived in. We know a lot of things about them that we don't, and we know what earnings they had, what unemployment they had, where they moved, who their neighbors are. And so we're able to really measure the full extent of what a welfare state in Denmark is acting on, what, how people are sorting, how people are, are interacting. So it's a very rich opportunity to study social mobility in Denmark. But as you were saying, as you were saying, this Denmark has actually been uh, viewed as a model state. And so, and the Danes themselves view it as a model state. It's not a socialist state. They would avowedly say, it's a social welfare state, they would say. Huge taxation, but huge provision of public services. More than half, I think, of all benefits that people receive come from the state, one way or the other. Um, And so this is viewed as ideal. 
And people see the Gini coefficients, especially after taxes and transfers, are much lower in Denmark than they are in the U.S. And that's, For income, that's a measure of that's a measure of inequality. The Gini of inequality, coefficient, wage inequality. So by a lot of the standard measures that OECD and many political thinkers and discussants and and economists, of course, too, would see Denmark as being a a garden of uh, opportunity, maybe a garden of Eden for social policy. And, and a part of the reason I think it's attractive is just to, to policymakers. Besides the idea that you might be in favor of some of those policies, is that uh, in a lot of the Scandinavian countries, measures of I'm going to say measures of measured happiness, uh, because those are <laughs> are fairly high, uh, yes. if if not some of the highest in the world. I'm highly skeptical of those measures. Uh, Self-reported, uh, I'm not sure if they tell us much across countries or even within countries, but that people do pay attention to them. We've paid, we've had a number of episodes on that, those. Uh, factors on econ talk, and I think people then say, "Well, look, this reduction in inequality uh, in in disposable income, in particular." Uh, and you were careful not to say anything about wealth because I think wealth is quite a bit less equal in Denmark than people might think. There is a large private sector in Scandinavian countries, which is why yes. they're not really socialist. They're social welfare states. There's a large public provision of certain kinds of services, education, childcare, and so on. But people say, look, they do all these services. They provide all these services at taxpayer expense. And look at the great result. People are happy. Now, you, of course, care about something other than just measured inequality. And, and the point of your paper uh, – you're free to comment, by the way, on this happiness literature if you want because I, I think it's a, I think it's a bizarre thing. But – the part that you focus on, which I think is quite interesting, we've also talked about it quite a bit on the program, is the question of, of mobility across generations. So you use the image in one of your papers of the apple falling close to the tree. So yes. if your parents are rich, are you going to be rich? Or are you, if your parents are poor, are you likely to be poor? What are your opportunities for rising above, both in relative and absolute terms, to concepts that are often confused uh, and conflated? They're very different. But those are the things that, that you're particularly interested in. And what's surprising, I think, about your paper and, and fascinating is that you'd find that actually in terms of intergenerational mobility, the ability of children to overcome handicaps of, of where the, how they were born, the fa the, their parental income, their family income when they were children, uh, it's actually not so different from the United States. Is that an accurate summary of what you found? It is. And if that fact that you just summarized is a shock to many yeah. Danes. I mean, uh, my co-author, Erasmus, who's at the Rockwell Foundation, I should point out, Rockwell Foundation is the name of it. Um, and uh, he has uh, become a star of a certain type, a media star, not because that's his instinct, but because literally the, the finding is so dramatic and challenges right at the core of what Denmark thinks it's all about. So yes, I think I think it's really uh, disturbing to many people that in fact intergenerational mobility, properly measured in terms of skills, in terms of how the next generation is really faring, is uh, really much pretty much the same. Family influence is very strong in Denmark, about as strong as it is in the U.S. And you can measure that many ways. It's not just the influence of family income; it's parental education. It's, you know, aspects of the parents and various kinds of, of uh, ways to describe the family. So it has not solved the problem, which is, or some people call it a problem, they have not broken the link between the family <clears throat> and child outcomes to the extent that people had hoped. And this, remember, this, these kids all get universal pre-K. I forgot about that. This is something that the Danes, I mean, again, everybody points to that. Again, Hillary Clinton or in an earlier era, Bernie Sanders to this day, and many, many others, not just politicians, economists and, and you know, foundation heads and so forth. It's become a commonplace. And, uh, and I think that is something that really needs to be reexamined. So the, just to restate the argument of the, of the people who, who uh, favor these policies and use Denmark as an exemplar, the idea would be that, okay – Sure, rich people have bigger houses than poor people. Rich people have maybe two or three cars. A poor person might have one car or no car. 
So rich people get more of certain things, but by providing the most important things for, for one's future economic ability and success, that is education um, and, and to make sure parents don't have – who are unemployed have income and are not constantly away and, and scrapping for – with anxiety and stress about it. a lot of people have argued that if we could put those policies in place in the United States, all children would start from the same starting ground, starting line. And then, yes, there might be some genetic differences across people. That's inevitable. There'd be differences in grit or perseverance. But the idea would be that rather than having a world where the rich get all the education and the poor because they don't have the resources or stuck with an inferior level, in theory, in theory, Denmark, everybody gets the same, as you said, same expenditures on education no matter what district you're in or where your neighborhood is and can get up to any kind of – up to college, up to PhD. I think you, you wrote that yes. all of that is, is tuition-free, no out-of-pocket expenses, and therefore everybody has the same opportunity, but you find that they do not. So why, why do you think – Assuming you're correct, we're going to take it as a, as a given. We're not going to go into the weeds to figure out whether the – how important the, any distinctions that are left are. But assuming you're right that rich children in Denmark tend to do a lot better than children who grew up in poor families in Denmark despite the attempt to equalize educational access, why is it? What is happening in Denmark that's offsetting or what's failing with their education system? It's often highly touted, by the way, as, as many of the Scandinavian systems are. What's going on there? Well, I don't know if it's a failure. I think it's just a fact that family life plays a fundamental role in shaping how children either succeed or fail. So, uh, and I think that's something that we currently deny in discussions in the U.S. It's so politically incorrect now. I mean, there's a whole literature now, and we're talking about Black Lives Matter, and we talk about opportunity for African-Americans to completely take the whole issue of the family off the table. Even though the issue of the family has been on the table since W.B. Du Bois was writing about this in the 19th century, it's been, it's always been on the table by serious scholars. But it's not just for African-Americans, it's for everybody. The family life plays a central role. And economic and social policies that ignore that are going to ignore a fundamental source of inequality. The Danish study is a very nice example. It's nice because what it shows is by the measures that people use, people are using these measures of Gini coefficients, how unequally distributed income after taxes and transfers are in Denmark versus uh, the U.S. Uh, <clears throat> and they look to those measures and say, here, see, it's equality. Everybody's equal. And in some sense, they are equal because taxes are very high. You can't rise too high, and uh, you can't really uh, sink too low because you have a very safe uh, social safety net. So all of that is true. Nonetheless, the role of the family remains, and it's powerful. And that, to me, was very striking. I had no idea it would be this strong and persistent. We have several papers on that, not just the NBER paper. We wrote an earlier paper, which we published, unfortunately, in a uh, Scandinavian journal, so it's... Scandinavian Journal of Economics, which is less well known, of course. But the fact of the matter is, is that we've documented this and have a series of studies. And my co-author at the Rockwell Foundation has also documented how a policies that have been targeted or not targeted have led to educational inequality and changed the nature of redistribution and inequality in Denmark itself. So I think it's interesting because we have such good data. Denmark is a wonderful laboratory. We can look at many factors and we can examine the role of private markets, uh, private choice, and families in creating this inequality. And it's real. The influence is real and lasting. And so when people talk about inequality being less in Denmark, what they're always talking about is after tax and after transfer. You qualified very nicely a minute ago. Before tax and transfer, there is a fair degree of inequality in what the wages are before taxes and transfer. And that doesn't account for all the other aspects of redistribution in the system. So there really is inequality in the sense that people with different skills are being paid different amounts of money. 
It's just that they're allowed to keep less of it. And that the state plays a far more powerful role in shaping what the final consumption bundle is. But that doesn't change family influence. It still matters which families have parents reading to them, looking out for the child's well-being, trying to find a good school, trying to find a good teacher, taking the kid to the zoo, doing all of these things that parents do. And that plays a fundamental role that people don't like to admit. Uh, the Danish family, you know, there's a lot of cohabitation in Denmark. You know, back in the 60s and 70s, Denmark and Sweden were considered free love countries. You know, the, the traditional American model of, um, of uh, marriage was uh, broken because there was a lot of cohabitation and experimentation. But nonetheless, what you'll see is that in Denmark, there's a tremendous, even the cohabitation turns out to be a form of a relationship that's very, very stable. And once children are born to a cohabiting couple, frequently they marry or they stay together as a union over the course. So the family is a much more stable entity, despite all of this alleged freedom. They can choose. This is a choice that people make. And I think that's fine. But the fact of the matter is that Children are growing up in stable, two-parent homes with a lot of support. But those parental years, those years at home, and the guidance the parents provide are playing a crucial role. And they continue to play a crucial role despite all of the transfers and free tuition and child care and preschool and this and that and the other thing. I want to make sure I understand the basic facts that you're trying to Yes, explain please. or understand. Maybe I'm going on too quickly. No, here. you're doing fine. You're doing fine. But just a one clarification, cohabitation just means two people living together who aren't married and they might have a child. And those impacts are, are very different. You're suggesting than a, a one parent family uh, with a child, oh, totally, a single totally. mother, a single father. But yes. but the point I want to get at, there's, there's sort of two things here. I'm worried listeners might be confused and I, I'm a little confused, which is you're saying the family is very important. Um, I, I certainly believe that or am prone to believing it, but are you saying the following? Let's try this. So you grow up in a poor family. Uh, let's say you're, you're, you're parent and you're in Denmark and we could also think, consider the United States. So you grow up in a poor family and your parents are poor, meaning your parents are poor. Their mm -hmm. wages are low. Um, you might have, um, they might only be one parent at home, so they may struggle to get the best, highest paying job they'd be able to get because they have to worry about child care in a way that a two parent family may not have to worry. But it sounds like you're saying that, so for that family, when that kid grows up, you're saying they're going to end up again, something like their parents, low income, but they're going to get a kick and a boost from the welfare state. So even though the family might play a role in replicating the original pre-tax, pre-transfer distribution of income. The government offsets it with some taxes and transfers. They take money away from the richest, most successful families, many of whom those they had come from rich families in their childhood. Yeah. And they boost up the poorest families because they get their education provided for free, they get their child care perhaps provided for free or just highly subsidized. So what's the dis what's discouraging about this if you're if you're a Dane? If you're from Denmark and, and you hear this result, why wouldn't you just say, well, so what? What's the big deal? So the welfare state has to compensate for the fact that poor children end up with poorer income when they grow in the poorest part of the income distribution when they get older and richer children, they also end up richer, but eh, the government kind of smooths it out. Is that is that how they'd react, or am I missing something? Well, that's the current policy, yes, and they're very proud of that policy. So there's no question, if I were to just state what government policy is and what many Danes would agree to, they would be completely on board with what the statement is that you just made. However, what are they what are they missing? What what's the what did you find that that's surprising to them? Well, what we find is that the children across generations are no more skilled that the children of low skilled parents, skills in terms of education, in terms of the social and emotional skills, in terms of various aspects of striving and engagement in society are really very different. They're still stratified by family origin. And that yes, they get the same material resources, but they don't have the same strategies for life. And they're not really fully inclusive. 
And so the sense of agency, of being a Danish child, of being, being fully developing your own potential is thwarted. And in fact, it is thwarted. Here's an example. In our earlier work, we didn't cite it in this particular paper uh, today, uh, the one you were citing a minute ago, but the structure that we found earlier was there was a program designed, targeted towards children who are very disadvantaged. And these were kids who had dropped out of school or were given some kind of uh, remedial training. And uh, so it was all well-intentioned. But what happened is the subsidy that they were given was a subsidy that more or less induced them not to go to school and not to work. And then the lifetime consequences of participating in so yes, they were equalized when they were 18 and 17, but when they were 35 and 36, they lacked the skills of those who had not participated in those programs. And so there, there are strong, powerful disincentive effects operating throughout the whole system. So it's, it's an issue that if you're guaranteed an income and you're told you basically don't need to strive too hard and you basically are told when you're in school but yeah, you know, you can finish school, but you can also get this subsidy that's targeted towards disadvantaged children. Those children will take that and they will not develop the skills that their counterparts might had they not participated in those programs. So there's a sense of incentives facing these children that do not promote their skills and their participation in the larger environment. So they become, I don't want to say detached, but they develop much less of what their potential might be. And in that sense, I think that uh, it creates a, a, a mentality that I think is very, very uh, dangerous uh, for their own well-being. It's harmful. And, and that's part of it. But the other part is that a lot of these parents in the, in the welfare state, they're, they're all well-intentioned. I'm not suggesting there's a malicious group of parents that are out there trying to hurt their children in any way. But some of the less advantaged parents uh, who are still advising their children on a day to day, you know, do your homework, go to school, you know, do this, do that, don't commit petty crimes, and so forth and so on. Those influences remain, and those children are not insulated against that. So they may have more money, more food on the table, they may have more income security, but some of the basic values that parents and families provide are missing. And that is not achieved, and it's not achieved by preschool, it's not achieved by uh, these nursery or child care centers or formal education. None of those factors compensate for what is missing, which is the early family years. And it's not like a government program per se is going to somehow galvanize the parents, not at least the kind that are in place in Denmark. And so I think the really important thing to recognize is that to me, this study emphasizes in a way that I'd never recognized the powerful role of the family, that the family is, is everything. And as an American looking into the whole discussion of inequality in the United States, seeing these $2 trillion packages, people trying to reenact the welfare state, you realize that these Biden formulas are basically reincarnations of the Danish welfare state. Almost line by line, unlimited child care. You know, universal pre-K, free college tuition. You go down the list of things that Biden promised in his presidential address and that many others. And it's not just Biden. It's not even just Democrats, a lot of Republicans. A lot of people really believe that if we put this list of social policies in place, the world is going to be a better place and provide opportunity. But it doesn't. And that's the part that I think it, 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 there's an improvement. There's a material improvement but you're not changing the dependence. So one of the traditional measures of educational of mobility is what the education of the family is, what the parents' education was, what the education of the children was, okay? And so what happened, it's a very interesting in Denmark. Very, we have long time series. We go back a hundred years. When I say we, no, we have, Denmark is of course a very, very, uh, they're famous for collecting data and for being very, very meticulous in analyzing the data. You know, the Danish actuaries in the turn of the last century were world, they, fam they found that actuarial science, but there's a lot of data, a lot of government statistics inaccurate. But one thing that was true 
was that in the 1900s, say 1910, a lot of Danes, a lot of inequality. If your father didn't go to school, you were much less likely to go to school. That's true in Denmark. And Denmark was primarily a rural society. And so what happened was that Denmark started expanding programs in the rural areas and targeting towards de disadvantaged children who didn't have education. And so for a while, those targeted programs operated in a way that actually promoted educational attainment. So there was a big rise in the 19, early part of the 20th century for Danish children to have much more education than that of their parents. Well, suddenly then, and this is an interesting part of it, around the middle of the 20th century, and this is work, by the way, from my co-author and, and the guy named Christensen, who works with him. And um, these guys actually showed that around the middle of the century, the educational policies became universal. So instead of going after the disadvantaged, they became across the board. And what happened was the social mobility that had been witnessed in the first half of the century started to vanish. And the reason why it vanished is very interesting. And that is universal policies give a, po a tableau, they give you a check. You can go out and cash this check. You can go out and go to these schools. But more educated parents, more affluent parents are better able to draw on that check, to advise their children, to reinforce what is being learned in those schools. And so those universally provided programs actually turn out to be a vehicle for promoting social immobility, relative immobility. That actually this idea of educate. So who was advantaged by these universal programs? the most advantage. And this is a finding that's been, it's not just true in Denmark, by the way, there's a study that was done, oh, I would say in school choice in uh, in uh, in Boston, a guy named Chris Walters at the University of California at Berkeley, very good economist. He studied the use of, of school choice and he found that school choice was actually very beneficial. And he found that school choice was particularly beneficial, charter school, very beneficial in uh, for the most disadvantaged children but and this is the interesting part who are the kids that were going to charter schools among those eligible the most advantaged it was the parents who sought out those schools so even though the bottom of the barrel would benefit more their parents weren't at that informed and so this universality really created more inequality than was originally intended and so that's the way that inequality can operate. The family plays a very important role. It's kind of like a captain in the wheelhouse, telling the child what to do, where to go, what opportunities to take, what steps to do and what not to do. Should you commit crime? Should you study at night? Do you do your homework? And on and on and on. And it's those subtle influences that nobody wants to talk about. And, and they're real. And it's beautiful because... Denmark is a case study where almost every obvious solution, quote, externally imposed solution, is at work here. Everybody's got the same tuition. Everybody's got this and that. And yet everybody doesn't go to college. They don't. They don't take advantage of these programs. And they don't. They're not getting the reading and writing and support. So, you know, to, we started off this program talking about the role of the family. And I would want to say, yes, let's talk about that. Because that is what I think the main lesson is that comes from this. And that even though you can tax and transfer successful people, but you can't tax and transfer them and make them into more effective or less effective parents. Those are things that actually need a somewhat deeper approach to really thinking about how you provide true social opportunity for children. It's not just a matter of money. Well, we'll come back to that. I, I, I want to I come back to something you said uh, a few minutes ago, sure. which is, I mean, I make, you made an allusion to um, our relationship going back 45 years or so. <laughs> when you came from the Social Security Administration. Yeah, I had taken uh, a break. You and I and Tom McCurdy. <laughs> yep, long We're time ago. Long time ago, yeah. <laughs> but I was taught in the mainstream of economics at the University of Chicago, as every undergraduate and graduate student is taught, that Utility, well-being, is a function of stuff. That 
the more you get you consume, the better off you are. And one of the implications of that, at least in the narrow sort of, I would call it, empty version, is that if you make $50,000 a year at a job that you might enjoy, and I replace that job and instead give you a $50,000 annual check, you could argue, and many economists would, that you're better off because now you still have $50,000 of stuff to choose from with your income constraint, and you have leisure, which is a value, and you can enjoy it by watching YouTube or learning Hebrew or mastering the, the guitar. And yet we know in real life, and this is what you were alluding to about agency and dignity, and we call it often on this program flour human flourishing, if yes. you don't have a good set of skills, uh, if the only way you have access to stuff is through the government giving it to you, your quality of life is not the same as when you exercise the skills you've acquired on your own, that you've chosen to acquire, that you've struggled to achieve and, and gain, and then apply them to making the world a better place by working by through the commercial world, serving others by producing something that other people are willing to pay for. And this idea, I think, that you know, it gets at a lot of, I think, interesting ideas that I hope we explore over the next months and, and even years and he can talk this focus on a universal basic income the idea that we can jumpstart development by giving people cash it's a topic i hope we'll have an, in, an episode on soon this idea that you just give people stuff then they'll be not just better off even but they'll have the ability now to to take advantage of that and and to grow and to they won't have the pressure say of of, of poverty on them and what this denmark this result in denmark at least is suggesting is that Actually, it doesn't help so much. E giving people equal access to education, which you'd think would be this great leveler, doesn't seem to work. And you're suggesting that's because the family differences still persist. And families are where we spend a good chunk of our day, about half of our waking hours, just like only half is in education. And a lot of that isn't really education. It's just a rear end in the seat. It's not actually the creation of human capital. And this romance we have about this, this equal access or – you know, free tuition is – it's masking what's really going on under the surface. Your point is that the families who are better for worse, the families who have lots of stuff already can push their children in directions. There's a hidden variable underlying the, the data is what you're suggesting, and it's – you're calling it family, but it's really about guidance, advice, molding, yes. mentorship – maturity, moral character, all kinds of attributes that aren't in the data set. But I, the point I well, they're wanna... slowly becoming in the data set. I, I mean, I can talk okay. about other work where we actually measure these attributes. But yes, increase, no, not usually in public discussion and usually not in public data sets. And not in the public data set in Denmark either. And just to clarify, data. just sure. to clarify, when, you, when you're talking about how, how remarkable the Danish data are that are available to you, one thing you did not mention, but I assume you just overlooked, is family family status. That that you have not just you saw, we you know we know every economic event of, of a person's life, how much they earned, and so on. But I assume you also know something about their parents' income, their parents' education, and so on. Correct? Absolutely. Where they work, we know their employer, and we know their peers, we know their neighbors. I can tell you in Denmark, I mean, this is all very confidential data, so I'm not going to the local newspapers and you know ratting on some billionaire or millionaire about who's paying or not paying taxes. But literally, I can find out what the public, what the social life is like, what the environment is like of a child growing up, who the parents associate with, what neighborhoods they live in, what are the property values, how do they appreciate, and so forth and so on. And then what's the role of the school, and what's the role. So yes, we have a lot of information. But, but you're absolutely right that these factors... I mean, as you know, you know this, there was a book written in the 19th century. I remember reading it a long time ago. I came across it in a used bookshop, The Reign of Quantity. And what this person was saying is what many people have said, and I think probably before and since, which is that it's just not a matter of money. It's just not a matter of numerical this, that, or the other thing. It's just not a matter of uh, scale and dimension or any of these measures we normally take. There's an element called quality. And in this case, 
the family is playing a very important role, but it's not, one thing you didn't mention in your dialogue, and I would add to it, is not only is the family providing this environment, it's literally shaping the preferences. It's shaping the sense of definition of self of the children yeah. from those families. Yeah. It's motivating them or discouraging them one way or the other. And that, I think, is an undervalued role. And certainly in the United States, you can't talk about it. You can't talk about it now, even though it's probably the number one problem. And most people who are perceptive about the underlying problems in American social life would admit that. But the fact of the matter is, is that, yes, but those traits are increasingly being measured. I mean, we can. I mean, I'm now in the middle of looking at interventions, not just in the U.S., but in China, Jamaica. And we look at things like grit. We look at things like how much do children. And these are interventions, by the way, that work with with families and they encourage the families to interact with the child. That's all they do. They're just basically teaching parents how to deal with their children. That's another whole story. But it does get to the essence of how when you target family life and that dimension of family life, how families are influencing their children, how much more successful the children can be. And we have a lot of studies on this now, and, and they're being launched and being, and being carefully evaluated and finding real benefits. But it's not money. See, this is the other part of it. I mean, there's this whole group of people. I hate to mention names. I won't mention names, but it's crazy. And these large foundations and all these people mean well. They're doing these experiments. They're going to give poor people $2,000 more a year for three years and see whether or not the neuroscience of their brain is transformed. Uh, there's a demented study you've probably heard about by a guy who is uh, actually a colleague. But it's crazy. He, he was one of the powerful pieces of evidence in support of giving people money by this guy was that the people who are starving to death get lower IQ scores than people who aren't starving. <laughs> That's viewed as the importance of money. Come on. I mean, <laughs> I put that on the same par as saying people who make decisions too quickly tend to make more mistakes than those who make it too slowly can make it with, in, in, in rational. But that's getting off target. What I'm saying is that some of the basic ideas about how we make the decisions that shape our lives, that's what families are doing. They're really guiding people and they're mentoring. They're really saying, you know, Johnny comes home, somebody beats him up at school, hits him in the arm. Johnny can have several reactions. One, you can go back and beat up the guy. You give Johnny a club or a gun or something. Or you talk to Johnny and say, look, try to avoid it. Reason. So there are a lot of ways that parents shape the lives and actions of their children. And it goes throughout the 18, 20 years the children are living at home and maybe longer. So, Well, I, I want to talk about the work. We're going to move away from Denmark for now. And I want to talk about the United sure. States. Um, I want to talk about two uh, type pieces of work that uh, Raj Chetty and his co-authors have worked on, one of which we've talked a lot about on this program in passing. Uh, the second, not so much. So the first one is about the American dream. And the second is about neighborhood effects. So in terms of the American dream, the study that gets an enormous amount of attention, which I find bewildering, but I want to get your take, is um, the finding that in America, if you in the old days, uh, you'd have a 70% chance of, of outperforming your parents economically. So I think it was 70 or 80. And then that means that only 20 or 30 do worse, but most of them do a lot better than their parents. That's one measure of the American dream. Uh, some say it's owning a house. I say that's the dream of the um, National Home Builders Association, not the American people. Right. But uh, if certainly it's a, we like this idea, Americans like this idea of, you know, I want to do better than my parents. That would be progress. And in the more recent cohort, I forget the, the birth year. I want to say 84, but I'm doing this from memory. More recent it's in birth the 80s, year, yeah. It's in yeah. the 1980s. You're born in the 1980s. That doesn't hold anymore. You only have a 50% chance of outperforming your parents, which means you have a 50% chance of underperforming them, which means basically you're stuck. You, know, you, you don't have any pro – on average, people don't, don't progress. And only the richest – 
uh, claim. It's often claimed that only the richest people are benefiting from economic growth. It's not widely shared, and the poor can't, quote, get ahead. This I find bizarre because there's a ton of evidence when we look not when we look in in time series data where we follow the same people over time that not only do the poor do a lot better than their parents, but the biggest gains often in percentage terms to start with, and even sometimes in absolute terms, go to the poorest people. Up until very recently, this is not like a one-time phenomenon. And more importantly, and this is the part I want you to react to, Chetty's results with his co-authors depend on a lot of assumptions. And, and as I've often applauded them on this program, they relax those assumptions in the appendix, <laughs> not, not in the body of the paper so much, but in the appendix. They give you a tremendous amount of, of information about the sensitivity of their results to the assumptions they've made. Those include things like family size and assessing economic well-being, because obviously uh, that's going to change your access to goods if you're living in a large family with many children versus a small family with a few children. Uh, there's going to be issues about all kinds of different factors. And when, when you, whether you measured the inflation correctly, which is a huge challenge when you're making these sure. these studies over time. So they relax different assumptions and they show that well, actually, it might not be 50, it might be closer to 70 or 68. And all of a sudden, it's like, well, wait a minute. What's our best estimate here? And I, I feel like the, the flagship banner of 50% is the one that, that was chosen, not because the assumptions were the most accurate or made the most sense. It's just it's the most dramatic. It certainly is the one that the, the journalists have, 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 have latched onto and spread. The American dream is dead. Do you think those results are reliable? Not whether they're, you know, obviously they were careful with the data, as careful as they could be. Do you think we fundamentally understand the transmission of intergenerational mobility in the United States in, in those data sets? No, I don't know if you saw my um, my uh, film. Uh, we had a tape uh, exchange I had where I discussed. I have of seen it. Papers. You I saw. have seen it, and I will link to it. But go ahead for those okay, who have no. not seen it. Okay, but the reason why I suggest that is that I raised a lot of these issues with Chetty, and he was right in front of me. So. This was not like I was writing some obscure column. I was sitting there in a lecture hall in Princeton with, with hundreds of people in the room asking them specifically, well, can you answer this? Can you answer that? Which you refused to do, by the way. There was very little response, very little give and take. Yeah, he more or less refused. Kind of, that, that's the strategy. I mean, it's all right if you, if you have the New York Times supporting you. In a lot of places, that's equivalent to having, you know, um, gold-plated uh, credentials, and you don't need to worry about lesser life like some academic raising points that the the data may be wrong. Let me just uh, let me just point out one of the reasons why I went to Denmark was that we can address some of the same questions in Denmark as we did in the United States. We can look at questions of social mobility, and we can look at questions of the way the data were actually collected. The data Chetty has are not as described. He does not really have long-term follow-ups for these children. He starts the children. The, he does not have complete family histories. He does not have a lot of the information that we know to be important about family life. For example, I'll give you one factor that's very important. It's been found repeatedly, and we certainly find it in Denmark. If the parent, if a parent has committed a crime, especially has gone to prison, or has somehow been treated adversely by the criminal justice system, the child, usually the boy, is much less likely to avoid that problem in the next generation. There's a very strong intergenerational transmission of criminal activity. Well documented. Pittsburgh you study. Deeply studied depressing. <laughs> yeah, it is depressing. But the fact of the matter, but Chetty can't control for that. What Chetty can do is he has very, very crude data. He doesn't follow individuals over their full life cycles. He has little snippets. Technically speaking, for a lot of the people who are in his survey, he doesn't even know who the parents were or what the family structure was. He can find them at certain selected periods of time after their birth. Now he's slowly, slowly getting better and better data. But in Denmark, we actually have complete life cycles. We know from the time of birth, until, you know, late in the life of the child, and as an adult, I should say. Uh, what they, and we can see that there are tremendous differences uh, in the quality of data. And it's not just better data. 
it makes a difference about what the exposure is. What is the family that's being captured in the Chetty study? And what is it about the, the so-called neighborhood? You know, he's really featured a lot, the neighborhood. And so, you know, I, I would say about the Chetty study, the following would be, I would make the following more precise point. First of all, the data are not what they're cracked up to be. It is not really a true measure of the life cycle of the well-being of children. It does not study family influence. Secondly, and something that I think plays a crucial role in the whole, the whole study, is it ignores the role of family in sorting and choosing neighborhoods where children grow up. And the reason why Jim, this is before, – yeah. Before you go on, I just want to clarify. There, there are two different kinds of studies that, that Chetty and his co-authors have done. One yes. I described in some detail, but the second one you're now talking about, sort of give listeners some background, it's been incredibly influential. It's this idea that where you grow up, the neighborhood you live in is 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 destiny. So if you grow up in, quote, a poor neighborhood, you will be poor. If you grow up in a rich neighborhood, you will be rich. And the implication, as far as I understand, I don't want to be fair to Chetty. I just want to say to listeners, I've invited Chetty to be on the program before, either he hasn't. Uh, chosen to, to be on it or he didn't get my email. And I'm not saying anything negative about him. And I certainly would love to hear his defense. And I'll let listeners watch the video that Jim referenced. And you can decide whether Chetty didn't respond to your criticisms or not. But in that work, <laughs> yeah, I'm being fair, in that work, uh, as I understand it, neighborhood, not just, not just country, not just state, not just city, but neighborhood is destiny. So you, if you grow up in a poor neighborhood, it's the neighborhood itself somehow that's disadvantaged you and that you then we, – we need social policies to offset that, that handicap. And your claim in the Denmark paper is that those neighborhood effects are merely proxies for family differences that they don't have data on. Is that correct? That's correct. This is a basic idea that what I'm drawing on is a very old idea, and it's actually written in – it's an, it's an important component of Milton Friedman's old book on the consumption function, which sounds like light years away from the current discussion. But at the time when Milton Friedman was doing his work, one of the many different ways uh, you could basically split the data, and this was like in the 50s when the data were much cruder than they are today. What you could do is you could form aggregates of places like cities or neighborhoods and so forth. And he used that in a very creative way. But what he was doing and what's relevant right now is the fact that in these neighborhoods, there's a lot of sorting going on. That poor people... Explain what you mean live, by that. Well, I mean that people who are more disadvantaged, say by a level of education, say by a level of background, criminal activity, uh, various kinds of other participation in social welfare programs, uh, people who are earning less money and therefore demanding less lower quality housing and so forth. Well, there are a lot of projects that actually concentrate the poor in ver for various reasons, put them geographically in the same location and provide benefits. And, you know, uh, and in fact, a lot of U.S. policy is given today where money is given to schools or given to organizations. If the percentage of children in the school on, on, on free lunches and welfare lunches uh, is, is over above a, a certain threshold. So that's, there is the kind of, and in fact, we know that people sort. And in fact, the one thing we do know, sorting is an important part of any free market system, of any system. And if anything, sorting has gone up in the last 20, 30 years. In the last 50 years, there's much more sorting on income, on education, on a bunch of traits that meaning, we think of meaning. as influencing families. Meaning people who have high income t are much more likely to live with people who have high – in the neighborhood. Yeah, they're with buying comparable quality housing. They're buying – they want comparable quality schools. Schools, yeah. And so, by the way, even though we're off Denmark for a second, there really is a sense that even though teachers are paid the same, they're paid the same, that t high quality teachers – and we know their quality because you know what their grades were in, in, in school. We know what their college transcripts were. So we can really measure quality that in more affluent neighborhoods, you find that the teachers who show up teaching there are higher quality. And this is just an old Chicago argument, right? You can't pay them any money 
but you can give them higher quality students, which makes their lives much more enjoyable. So it's a non-market response to a market uh, imperfection. But anyway, coming back, there's a lot of sorting going on. And that's ignored completely in the Chetty study. He just ignores that because he doesn't have good data on family background. He doesn't know what exactly family influence is like. As you say, you don't know criminal history. You don't have any measure about really the education of the parent. These data are very, very crude. A lot of these are administrative data, like Internal Revenue Service documents. So you're so, arguing you're arguing that a lot of Chetty's results are actually being driven by not the neighborhood, but by the characteristics of the family that he can't By the serve. people who sort yeah. into that neighborhood. That what we call neighborhood effects are really family quality effects. And it's a result of sorting that goes on in the labor market. And we can find that. We, and, and we go back to Denmark, uh, keep going back, because we have so much better data there, we find that once we control for that kind of sorting process, these neighborhood effects go away. Yeah. I mean, it's literally that, that what is a neighborhood is a, an agglomeration of families and what families do. And so we're back to families again. But well, going back to the first study, I think one going back to the very first study, you want to talk about Chetty's earlier study. You mentioned this figure about how, you know, 70 percent of families or children did better. If you look closely at Chetty's Atlas of Opportunity, have you noticed where some of the states are that have the best? Social mobility. Have you seen the ones that have the highest rate? They're in Western Kansas. They're in Nebraska. They're in places out of the Great Plains. Now, what do we know about the I Great gotta move. Plains? We got to move there so your children will thrive. Everybody ah. should go to go to Kansas. Yeah, but you got to become a farmer first, my friend, yeah, and go into a declining and, industry. <laughs> and you need and you need a, a, a probably a few grandparents as farmers too. You got to you got to acquire both. Exactly. You got to move and build a heritage. <laughs> No, but see, some of these dimensions about how mobility has declined, you have to understand that some of the, the first cohorts in those Chetty studies start from people who were born or so were raised and are first sampled in the 1940s. In 1940, we were coming out of a Great Depression, and we we're leading agriculture. The U.S. was still highly agricultural. So if you look at social mobility in the 40s and 50s, a huge amount of it had to do with the recovery of the economy and, people and leaving the mobility the farm. from yeah. the rural to the urban yeah. areas. And that's true for blacks and for whites and everybody. We gave up on the farms. We Agriculture became very productive and we left behind a group of people, very few people, who were on average making much more income. So the fact of the matter is that study, those studies are very heavily flawed. But let me just give you uh, uh, a, uh, you were mentioning the Atlas of Opportunity, or I was, uh, this influential study that's in the New York Times. I have a colleague named Magna Mogstead, very smart guy, he's Norwegian, uh, member of the Chicago faculty. He's the Gary Becker Professor of Economics at the University of Chicago, very accomplished individual. He and his co-authors did something very interesting. They took a look at these neighborhoods that are in the Atlas of Opportunity. And remember, these are zip codes. These are very small neighborhoods. And he asked a very narrow statistical question. None of the above, nothing worse. Just ask me, are, are the mobility patterns in one neighborhood statistically significantly different from those in another? In other words, could all of this arise by chance? And the answer was, yes, it could. These were not statistically significant differences. These atlases were just basically artifacts. It was numerology. It was not hard evidence that these neighborhoods were somehow predictive. And, of course, as I said earlier, the neighborhood analysis ignores the fact that people sort. And it's crucial. It's crucial to their identification. It's a very crucial identifying assumption. We've done a lot of work on it in the context of Denmark. I'm assuming the Danes are not like the United States that the mobility process is there. The key identifying assumption in the Chetty work, the key assumption, he acknowledges it. If you look at his papers, he acknowledges it, is that basically people decide where they live, where they live, basically randomly in terms of the age of the child. Now, anybody who's had kids knows that when you have like three and four and five-year-olds, you start thinking, what school is this kid going to go to? What neighborhood is he going to go to? They sort. 
And all that mobility associated with families settling down, it's all over. A lot of it is over by five, six, and seven in terms of the age of the child, certainly by the age of the second child. That's all ignored. It's basically assumed that it's a random process. That is the key. It is so crazy. You can see that in the video. I said, ask a real estate agent. Do you think people aren't asking about the quality of schools? Are they asking about what the crime rates are? And when are they doing it? When their kids are 16 years old or when their kids are basically five and six when they're really trying to decide a neighborhood. And so literally what this is, is this is kind of like a social planner's dream. You can randomly assign people and they have, and nature has randomly chosen where people decide to live or not live. And, and it just defies the nature of what families do. Well, so, I, think we sh I think we should move away from, from Professor Chetty's work for, for a moment. And again, I invite him to come come to Econ Talk and defend his work. I hope I hope he will. I'll I'll explicitly and formally invite him after this episode airs. And he may choose to, he may choose not to. It's up to him. But I, I, I'm gonna defend Shetty, even though I've been skeptical of some of his findings. Like all of us, he I'm sure has some political views, he has an ideology. Um, I think he believes deeply that he is in search of the truth and that he has found it or identified it. And I just as a explanation, by the way, when you say an identifying assumption, that's a technical term for an econometrician trying to measure the impact of one variable, and it can be hard to do. And so the assumption that, that neighborhood choice is random is what allows him to conclude what he does. I, I think he's, I th well, I know, he's said it many times, he said it publicly, that he thinks these kind of econometric techniques, techniques that you were not literally part of, but certainly the field that you're, you've spent your whole life in, are the road to good economics, the road to truth, the road to good public policy, and that that's how we should teach economics. Uh, he's, a, he's, a, he's a very um, outspoken advocate for, for teaching economics as a form of empirical work uh, rather than a, an art, rather than a, a, a field of human behavior. Uh, he's an applied statistician. Now, you think his statistical work is, is flawed. Uh, I, I'm sympathetic to your view, but to defend him, he, he feels otherwise, and, and many others do as well. So I, just to, I want to give him the benefit of the doubt and, again, invite him to come defend himself in, in, in the first person. Um, well, I, 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 don't, I, I have no – you know, what, one thing that I find ironic is that uh, years ago, uh, I wrote papers with Chetty's father. <laughs> so I've known Chetty – I've known Chetty since before his birth. Uh, no, I, I was just cleaning out some boxes and I came across a draft of good paper, I think. It's still highly relevant. With Chetty's father is a, is a health economist at Boston University. Good economist, a very good economist. Learned a lot from him. We were together at Columbia years ago. But, but no, I don't want to attack Chetty per se. And I, know, I can't say whether he's sincere or not. I can honestly say he's not careful with data. And I can almost honestly say he's not careful with econometric ideas. So I don't know what, what you heard him say, but you might want to tune in on some of his lectures that he gives to HUD and to some of the other agencies, especially during the Obama administration. He might sound very measured in certain academic settings, but when he's sitting there on the stump in HUD with a bunch of people willing to hand out huge sums of money trying to support more work on neighborhoods, then you're going to you're going to find a very different person, Hud more Bain. evangelical and less uh, econometric. Perhaps. Figure. Well, he's so, not alone. All he's he's not that alone that, in that way. He, no, every no, he's not alone. He adapts very well. But but what I am suggesting is that this is such a basic point, and the point hasn't been the point hasn't been taken. It's not been the point has not been met, and it's been out there now at least since the time I made that uh, video. And I can't imagine anybody who listened to this not thinking exactly that point. Anybody well, trained in economics. I mean, what the hell? The only reason why it wasn't immediately said, it wasn't like a king without clothes, little boy calling out, was it's cloaked in a kind of obscure econometric language, which sounds very, very, very exact. And, you know, when I had this discussion at, uh, at uh, Princeton that you saw, the other commentators, none of them were econometricians, none of them were statisticians, none of them understood the technical difficulties. They didn't. They were commentators. Well, they, they, they liked the message. 
there was one person, I think, who was the dean of the School of Education, Berkeley, and William Julius Wilson, who was a very good friend, not technical person. And then uh, this guy uh, who writes for the Wall Street Journal, Dalston. I mean, all these guys were, you know, econometric weaklings. There's no other word for them. And they didn't challenge the basic quality of the data. They were overwhelmed. And they well. thought, this is an amazing piece of work. And I, I happened to be an economist, and uh, I was probably a huge mistake that I was invited. <laughs> and I think that nobody watches, listens, or say, so that's okay. But the, less, the message here is very, very important. And that's the part that actually bothers me. But uh, yes, I agree that uh, from a certain point of view, I agree with everything you said. But I think the reality speaks otherwise. <laughs> well, again, listeners and viewers can watch that video. It's, we'll, we'll link to it. Um, I want to move to a more philosophical question uh, in terms of policy and, and these findings of yours and, and of others that, are, that, are, that disagree. But I don't think – I think most people understand – that family is important. They may not want to emphasize it in their policy discussions. You know, one of the issues that's come up, we've talked about charter schools in this program, is that some of the best charter schools, what they're really good at is picking parents, not so much at picking students. And they exactly. find ways exactly. to get parents uh, who are driven, ambitious, and will motivate their students, their parent, their children, to be the ones that get chosen. They, they put up a lot of hurdles, uh, and I think that's true. And there may be good reasons for that, but it, it does cloud our assessment of these schools and of a public policy generally. But, but if we accept your point that family is important, and I think every parent accepts it because we, most parents do pay attention to all these things. We do try to motivate, inspire, lead our, stu our children. What's the role for public policy then? What's, what's left? Now, there's sort of two choices here. There's the Denmark model, which basically says, okay, we got a lot of problems with families, uh, differences, but we'll try to offset those with public policy taxes to transfer us and do the best we can, which is one view. Second view would say, uh, I, don't, I don't like either of these, but these are sort of the standard two views that are out there. The second view would say, well, we obviously, have to, if the family's important, we have to find ways to make the family better. Uh, and and we, should, we should subsidize families staying together so that there's two parents. Uh, especially as, as other institutions in our society are struggling, most obviously being the religious community, which used to be a, a key complementarity uh, to the family, right? The way that religion and family would work to create values and ethical and moral character. That's dying in America, it, it feels like. Should government step in? Are there programs that, that government could, could activate and, and fund that would help the family. My view is that's a mistake for a thousand reasons, but I'm curious what you think. Well, I don't think the government should step in. To, I mean, I, there, the idea of shotgun marriages and the idea of forcing uh, stable two-parent families under the gun or whatever is not going to work. I mean, it just doesn't work. I do think there's a larger issue which needs to be addressed and has been historically addressed. I mean, I don't know how much of the work of Gertrude Himmelfarb you ever read. Small I, know little, I know a little bit about. Well, not much. I, think, I mean, a lot of people, I know that Posner thinks lowly of her, <laughs> that, you know, that she's, uh, and, and she can, she was, she's not dead, but she was a, uh, there, there was an element of being a prudishness, but she wrote a lot about Victorians. And, and that was a response to poverty in the 19th century. And that's, that's a response that doesn't receive, and that was a kind of theme partly by religion and partly by social, but it was partly an adoption of cultural policy. I don't think it was a sense that a government mandate came along. I think there was a sense about- It's well, a set of norms. A set norms. of norms, yeah. Exactly, and they were, the, the churches promulgated that but there was a sense in which we recognized that a certain set of values were very beneficial for the society as a whole. You know, respecting laws, uh, respecting each other, a sense of civility. All of those were basically part of that culture. That wasn't always true. I mean, if you go back to England in the early 19th century, you know, you go to these uh, reform movements like the Methodist revival or the Welsh revival or 
there were a lot of these religious movements. You've heard of, you know, like the first, the second, and the third kind of great, uh, great awakenings. Those are religiously motivated. They were really people recognizing that they needed to reform their lives. So we went from the poor houses to a form of Victorianism. I'm being very crude now. I'm recognizing I'm not really taking into account, you know, Helma Farb, who are listening to this, should be horrified. But nonetheless, if you look at what her work is, these Victorian values played a very important role, I think, in kind of motivating people. That's true. Freud was right. There were a lot of superficiality, hypocrites. Nobody was a true Victorian in the sense. And it became, you know, uh, it became a party game. It became an uh, open season on Victorianism in the early part of the 20th century. You know, eminent Victorians and Lytton Strachey and all of those people. But the fact of the matter is there was kind of a cultural force sort of suggesting what appropriate behavior would be, which led to movements like prohibition and so forth. Now, some of that the prohibition was a disaster. We know that. And so the question then becomes, how do you achieve that moral force? How do you achieve the recognition of those values? And I think that is what probably needs to be attacked. But I'm not for sure. I'm for sure feeling that some government policy is not going to do it. But having some politicians say, you know, be good to your kids or do. The only government policy that I favor in this regard and I think it does help to an extent. And it comes back to your comment on charter school. I think a government policy that kind of builds the role of parent as a, as a guide, as a cultivator of the morals and motives of, and uh, academic achievements of the children, programs that kind of encourage parents or caretakers, whoever they are in that capacity, can be very successful. That's completely voluntary. You're coming into people's homes. People can say, go to hell. And it's like charter schools. You were, you were criticizing charter schools. I think it was great that charter schools are operating as a filter. They're, what they're doing is they're encouraging parents who care about their children. I wasn't criticizing them, just for the record. I was saying yeah, that, no, no, that, but I'm that saying clouds that, our ability to assess their effectiveness. No, it, is, it does in a sense if we randomly apply it to the population. Yeah. But what we're really doing, is we're t and this is something people don't like to admit, we're tapping into something else. Yeah. We're and then maybe we could think about it in the way you just described and then describe to the parent, look, if your kid does go to the charter school and you do put in the time and effort, your kid's going to do better than you do. So I would turn it around and say, no, it's not like we can randomly. See, right now you have this whole group of people doing, you know, assignment of charter schools and does it work and does it not work. And the persistent finding is it works because for the most disadvantaged, it does work for the most disadvantaged, but the most advantaged get in, like the Walters article I was telling you about earlier. But that's found across a number of programs. And there's a reason for that. And so I think what it's really telling you is you want to think of policies that ignite. And some of those policies are policies that are internally grown. You know, for a while, they're no longer true, unfortunately. But, you know, Bill Cosby at one time, when he was free of all of these charges and public controversy, was a major spokesman for trying to insist that black parents take care of their children and motivate them. Now he's discredited. But there are many other African American figures who are doing exactly this role. They and that's recognize all, that's Still, all private. That's all private. It's that's private. all cultural, exactly. and it's great. It, I think it's great. I, mean, I, I want to actually go yes. ahead. Go ahead. No, 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 no. But I mean, when you talk about government policy, what I see coming in, especially now, with these kinds, of, there's this whole there's a there's a group of people. They're very enthusiastic. They, they claim to see a big impact on, on, uh, on child development and on child achievement by giving families more money. And what they're doing is they're studying a correlation, and they're not really, and they claim to be doing these experiments which show this. The, the, the government, the, the opening of casinos on Indian land apparently did lead to more Indian children going to school except for one little detail that some of these programs had the, had the feature that they could only collect the money if they sent their kids to school. 
elected. So yeah. it was basically what was called in what's called in Mexico, Progresa. There are these incentive programs offered to families to try to get their kids to go to school. Uh, and those seem to have an effect on the children, especially in rural areas where the kids are agricultural labor. So I think there are policies which we can encourage more active family life. But the fact is that there needs to be a sense in which the parents, I mean, we have this huge group of people now having children and not being responsible for them, just not taking into account the well-being of the children. There's a loss of accountability that somehow has been sanctioned. It's been sanctioned and it's viewed as liberating, right? Freud well, it said is. It's, no, it still is. You know, it's me too. I want to, you see these stories, you know, the woman gets on and says, oh, I was being oppressed. I didn't, I wasn't being the true me. I was spending all my time washing the diary diapers and taking care of the kids. And now I can be a new avant-garde artist in Paris. I'm going to run away from my family. And that's viewed as the final expression of human liberation. And with it then is the decline of any sense of accountability for one's actions, including including the children and the aftermath, the consequences. And I would say the same is true for you know this whole discussion about masks and other things. There is a fundamental failure for people to be held accountable to say, look, <laughs> we get vaccinations, we get smallpox shots, we do certain things because there is a responsibility to the larger population. And that is, I don't want to call it a moral duty, but it is a duty. If you're going to be a part of society, you should try to make sure that society thrives. And I think we don't hold it responsible. I mean, I, I think it's crazy that this issue of masks has become a political issue. It's not no, it's a, a tragedy. It's, a, it's tragedy. a tragedy. It has nothing to do with infringing on the liberty of others. It has to do with something that Every economist knows externalities. What you're doing is you're making it easier to transmit a disease to vulnerable people. And I don't know. But you see, that's part of the whole era of it's me and me alone. Yeah. And I think that that's here. I'm sounding very evangelical or something, but, and I'm not appealing to a higher authority necessarily, although appeals to a higher authority in an earlier era were, we're successful. Yeah, it, it, we're yeah, they were effective. Yeah. I don't gone, know mostly. if that kind of appeal is going to work anymore. I don't think I mean, so. Nobody's going to believe that. Uh, I just think it's too secular uh, uh, society these days, and I don't think that's going to be effective no. in most quarters. So well, I want to. I want to close. We're sure. out of time. I, I, Sorry, I'm wanna, getting carried that's, away. We've that's right. Long lost Denmark. Maybe we're back to Kierkegaard. I don't know. <laughs> oh, fear <laughs> and trembling. Fear and trembling. Um, yes. I, actually, I want to. I want to pick a different philosophical issue to close with than we've talked about so far, which is um, I think a lot of our focus as economists and policy analysts uh, is driven by what's measurable generally. And yeah. we spend a lot of time focused on income and equality of income and growth in income. And it's not irrelevant, but it isn't the thing that human beings care the most about. I think the thing that people care the most about is friendship and love and connection to other people and dignity and respect and agency yes. and a sense of meaning in your life. And income doesn't do that. We, we can talk about it all day long. It's not good to be hungry. We all understand that. No one's suggesting that it's irrelevant income, but, but our, our focus as economists on income because it is easily measured and collected by the government. When what we really care about are these other things, like agency, dignity, and, and responsibility, and a, and a sense of meaning, we're playing a weird game. Because those are the things we can measure, then those are the things we develop policies for, that we then see if they work. Because those other things, the dignity thing, is just too hard. We don't have anything to say about it, not in the data set. And I feel no, like- But we do, but we do. We can look at individuals who lead lives where they are self-sufficient where they are actually taking care, they're making their own way and they're able to make their own choices and they act as autonomous beings. We can measure autonomy in many ways in terms of life cycle choices. The people who go to prison, who don't, the people who, who uh, take certain actions, uh, including these actions regarding children and 
mobility, where they live? I think we can, but I agree with you. When, of course, going back to one of your earlier comments, the way that people have responded to it, the whole happiness movement, we completely agree with what you just said. But that's kind of the ultimate form of hedonism, where the idea is, I, I just want to be happy. That's my goal in life. And in fact, I don't even know if that's true. I mean, think about uh, what was it? Aldous Huxley. Remember the famous book? And we, when we think about the Brave New uh, World, the Brave New World, we think of those people who are kind of caught up in that uh, kind of drug induced uh, happiness state. Soma was the drug. Soma, exactly. Which, by the way, did have a genuine, there really was something called Soma, and it really did exist. And it came down from uh, the northern part of India. But that's another whole story. There is a drug. There is a flower. And you can see it in Afghanistan to this day. But put that to the side. The fact of the matter is that, that, the, uh, that you're right. It's the agency and dignity. It is striving that, we ma- and that matters. And uh, you know, Nietzsche would say that. It's, it's the conquest. Of the, we all know that. Remember there's a person who was in Chicago as a psychologist when you were a student, a guy named Chick Mahali, you remember that? Mm-mm. Well, Chick Mahali wrote the book, but the book and many coaches and, 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 and life motivators use the book, but it's about the value of life is responding to the challenge. It's not the sure. final goal. It's getting to the goal. It's striving. You know, Richard Robb has recently written a book. Yep. That, He's that, been on this program talking about it. Yeah, no, Exactly. So I think, though, although I think he should have kept more of the Chick Mahali line, but that's another whole story. But nonetheless, I think the structure of striving, and that's the part that people find difficult. And I think maybe that's because politically it's easier to sell this notion of not striving, that we have these objective measures. So, you know, in my own narrow interest in child development, for example, People use income as the measure of disadvantage, whereas my measure and the one that I think matters most is the quality of the home, the environment in which the child's raised. And anybody who knows child development knows that that's valid. But nonetheless, the measures that are used in public policy. And so understanding. This, so that's that's where you're saying. Cause there, so you're saying, is there a public awareness? Can, is there a public policy? I can't see many public officials standing up and say, respond to life's challenges. Okay. But no, no they're, they're no. saying their favorite line is what can I do to make life easier for you? Period. Yes. You, exactly. you know, let me take well, someone else's course. money. <laughs> Here's another 2000 this month or something. No, yeah. exactly. And the idea, and so we really are building this dependency state and with the entitlements and with this whole sense, we're slowly eroding this, ability to sort of operate in an autonomous fashion. And so even though Brooks may say the autonomous agent, the free roaming, free roaming uh, individual is somehow dead and we all are in this common union together. Yes, we like friendship, but we also want to have a sense that we've done something ourselves, yeah. however modest. Yeah. You know, what was it? You know, Veblen had this book. It was really very good. And it was called the instinct of workmanship. And he really did. He was a, kind of the Freud of the early 19th century among economists. And he really did say we have this deep desire to be a craftsman, to have accomplished something. Yeah. And there's a deep sense of pride, whether it's putting a bottle, a ship inside a big bottle, whether or not it's uh, building your own home, whether or not it's even having a beautiful garden. Those senses of account, and everybody would say that, even the most destitute welfare client would be take pride in saying, look, see, I made this, I, I improved my room, I have this window, my house is a much nicer place. So I think most people want a sense of achievement. And I just think they need to be motivated more. But the trouble is that now with electoral politics being what it is, that different groups can only promise more and more goodies and say you can do it without effort. And, but the labor leisure choice you were referring to, most people, I mean, years ago, you know Victor Fuchs, right? Victor sure. Fuchs at Stanford. Remember years ago, I was doing work on labor supply, as were you, you know? And we had the traditional labor leisure trade-off. 
I remember Victor asking me a very good question. I was just out of graduate school, and I remember he says, you know, you have this idea of leadership. But do you realize that people really enjoy their jobs? And he's right. We, they do. They, they, some, do. they enjoy some, the not work. Not everybody. Not everybody, but many. Not everybody. But, it, of course, if you were lifting heavy weights in the bottom of a gold mine somewhere in Siberia, my guess is you enjoy it. But, but even there, I bet you there are some people who lift weights much better than those who don't. And they would enjoy being a master lifter of weights in the bottom <laughs> of the gold mine in Siberia. So I think that that we don't appeal to that aspect of human humanity, and I think, and I think we're the poorer for it. I think, we, and the question is, is there a way to proceed? And yes, it is. I think what it is is that we don't just tell people they're responsible; we sort of tell them the consequences of their being responsible, and then we leave it to them. That's been the guiding principle of a lot of my work on early childhood recently. That it's really educating the mother or the caregiver to tell people how powerful her role is. Just to say, you have an important role here and you can do something about it. And it's very surprising how many disadvantaged mothers will, will rise to that occasion. They will see it, right? Because the child is the one thing they value the most in life. This, this is their creation. This is something that they, this is their legacy. So I think we, if we're clever, I'm not trying to, you know, devise a political campaign to carry the 33rd ward or something. What I'm really suggesting is that if we really are careful in reconstituting the way we think about what value, I think we can do something. I think we can motivate people. To but do my better. only my only criticism of that is that the goal isn't to help their help mothers be more inspired to help their kids stay in school longer and make more money. Their goal should be to educate their children into the fullness of what it means to be a human being. Oh, exactly. And I think, no, and I think no. we've lost that. Well, I think we have because many people would argue that many of these values, I mean, you can see it now. It's even in the Smithsonian. Some of the, I'm told, the Smithsonian museums that, that attitudes towards hard work and aspiration for the future and saving for the rain, rainy day, that's considered uh, an attitude that is, uh, that is basically uh, – being foisted on you from an external society and it's not intrinsic. And I think there's no evidence that a policy of that sort leads to anything resembling a quality of life. Nothing. My guest today has been Jim Heckman. Jim, thanks for being part of Econ Talk. Well, nice to see you again, Russ. Hope Always. to see you again. Take care. This is Econ Talk, part of the Library of Economics and Liberty. For more Econ Talk, go to econtalk.org, where you can also comment on today's podcast and find links and readings related to today's conversation. The sound engineer for Econ Talk is Rich Goyette. I'm your host, Russ Roberts. Thanks for listening. Talk to you on Monday.